Hi, I'm Mark Crisano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Today, we're going to discuss with you the Three Gorges Dam, give some updates on flooding, what's happening at the dam, what's happening in the Yangtze Economic Corridor, and then really what is, what's driving, what's happening in the Chinese economy, and how is that going to be impacted based on the level of flooding that we've continued to see. So when we turn and just and just really kind of dive right in, we want to look at the flood water. So right now there's been a four clear peaks in actual flood surges with the fifth one arriving today and continuing through essentially the next three to four days. The Three Gorges Dam uh, company is trying to manage upstream and essentially the Three Gorges to try to mitigate some of this flooding as it surges through the river. The problem is going to be how attainable is that just given the sheer size and just density of water that's been coming down. So when we look at what's being uh, forecasted, so that uh, so China's southwest, northwest, and northeast in the next three days are going to see this massive increase, and we've actually seen the highest warning level ever in Sichuan, which is going to be a problem, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So right now, the the Ministry of Water Resources is estimating about 37 million people in, directly impacted. Depending on who you listen to, it's anywhere from 37 to 60 million. And then the obviously the economic impact is is massive. Right now, it's estimated at about 25.8. But when you start to do some of the math, factoring in crops, livestock, it's it's near over now about 55 billion. This is going to be a problem because when you look at just the total flood levels, you know, there's a, a significant amount of damage and and it's not something that's going to be cleaned up all that quickly, just given the amount of mudslides, the amount of continued rain that is going to impact the region. So, and then <laughs> to make matters even worse is, you, you know, they're going to be facing a typhoon Higos, which hits, which is the seventh storm, which hits Wednesday into uh, Friday, which is, again, is going to create another issue. And then a, a nice little tidbit to kind of understand the sheer size. There is a Buddhist uh, statue that in a thousand years has never had its feet washed with the Yangtze River. And now it is currently about six feet on, on onto the actual statue itself, just to give you an idea of where that looks like. But we have an interesting picture that kind of covers just the sheer size. So here is just, a, you know, when we're looking at this, this specific chart, you can see the upper reaches, middle reaches, lower reaches. Again, that's also how they dictate the different economic zones to understand the sheer uh, economic pitfalls because about about 40 to 50% of Chinese GDP, depending on the year and manufacturing, is really generated in this region. So it's a clear impact across the globe, uh, across not, not just China, but also the globe in terms of the amount of people and companies that actually operate. Uh, rice patties were just recently destroyed, which is going to impact rice, even though the CCP says otherwise. And then the other issue is going to be livestock. You know, some of these some of these horrible pictures and videos that have been coming through are just showing uh, cattle just being washed down the river, which again is going to impact just total meat consumption and meat demand. Uh, it's going to uh, Im impact meat supply as meat consumption has already been hit with the swine flu and other issues, and we've already seen pork increases. Uh, move exponentially in terms of just pork prices. Now we have cattle. So this is going to be something to watch. The bigger problem here is just where's the maximum level. So when we when we shift to the next slide, the, the peak has been 164 uh, meters. And now that we're seeing that push again. So when you look at just the way the Three Gorges Dam is built in terms of maximum capacity. So during the dry season, in order to maintain pressure, the peak is about 175, not that it ever really gets there. But during the flood seasons, they, it's kept at 145, and then it ebbs and flows. And now we, we continue to see this push higher as about 70, uh, 75,000 meters per second are expected to hit in this fifth wave you know, coming into the reservoir, which is going to put additional pressure on this, uh, on the dam itself. And then obviously the Three Gorges is about 185 meters high. And there are a certain amount of floodgates that it, so it doesn't really crest over. There are floodgates that would uh, alleviate, but again, it would just create a, a bigger issue downstream where flooding already remains well above capacity, which is a, a huge problem when you consider just economic throughput. 
So here's that 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 interesting chart when we're looking at you know what's happening with the Buddha sculpture. You can see that it's you know there are people standing in front of it. You can see the foot is about six meters high, and you know right there you're, the water is already over that six feet that those six meters, which is going to be you know again just showing the sheer size and the sheer. Uh, just how voracious this uh, this the, the river is. But now when we turn to the dam, we, we talked about in our last update in terms of the issues that we really kind of talked about. And the problems continue to grow in terms of landslides because the issue was when you have the reservoir mo- essentially expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting, you soften the shore and we're seeing those mudslides coming down and that silt contains to be, continues to be a problem. The other is there was actually registered another earthquake. Now, one of the bigger problems during a study was the amount of earthquakes that could be uh, increase because there are two fault two fault lines that would impact the Three Gorges Dam. So between January 2000 and May 2003, 94 earthquakes were recorded. Since June 2003, 3,429 have been recorded. So to give you an idea, the, the there is a huge problem in terms of just not even six years after completion, you have this huge um, uh, surge in uh, in earthquakes. And then the other concern has always been how much can they actually hold back? And as we see, like, and, and again, it, it's depending on who you follow, who you're seeing. You know, right now the Three Gorges is projected to hit, you know, that 74 to 76,000 uh, cubic meters per second at 8 a.m. Thursday is supposed to be kind of where that, when that crest hits. And it's just, this is now the second time in five years that we've seen this kind of unusual record rainfall with 2020 being the highest since uh, they've started keeping track in 1961. So this is just kind of giving you an idea of what the problems are and the fluctuations and just the impact to not only the dam itself, but the ecological impacts that could really impact the stability as we continue to go forward. And this just looks at some key dam areas and and you can see the the water levels and the fear levels, you know, marked in red. So you can see that there's already going to be kind of that push higher. The flow rates coming in, again, depending on who you're listening to at what time it was taken, is at 73,800 in. And right now the Three Gorges Dam is trying to push out about 49 to 50,000, which again is going to impact downstream as well, which remains saturated, which we're going to look at in terms of the different components. So when we look at the Three Gorges Dam, this is a, a great chart that really kind of highlights what is the surge ratio. And you can see the clear peaks in terms of those flood um, issues with the fifth one clearly being a top. Now, I, again, this is one where you're, you're, we continue to see this pressure coming in and the flow rates are, are shifting that up and to the right. And the bigger problem on the Three Gorges Dam, and as we look at the, the global economic impact, is going to be how is manufacturing being seeing those issues across the board. So when we look upstream, when we look at, okay, well, what's happening upstream? What are What is the flow level? You can see again that this is up and to the right with the average being about a, a flow rate of about 80,000. So you can see that just the sheer size of the water flowing through. And this is what the Three Gorge Dam Company is trying to mitigate is let's keep some of these, let's keep some of the floodgates closed as long as possible to try to stagger some of this flood water moving through and hitting the Three Gorges Dam and trying not to saturate downstream to mitigate some of the floodwaters that have already taken lives, livestock, and have impact, impacted millions of people. And here, when we look downstream, again, this is what they're trying to avoid. You can see things kind of normalized, and then we get this quick surge back up, and it's really being driven based on just the floodplain, but also where the rain is sitting and how things have just uh, had essentially been a pass through through the dams because there's not uh, there's not enough size to just stop it so they're trying to stagger it again to try to mitigate or at least alle- uh, alleviate some of the pressures downstream and here you can see where those those issues and just in terms of what those floodplains look like we used this chart last time just because we think it's a very good way of looking at the depressions within the valley and how that impacts the different components you know, the Ministry of Water Resources was saying that there are 38 tributaries in the upper reaches of the Yangtze, which were uh, reaching their maximum warning levels. 
uh, 19 of them at a dangerous level. And th- th- again, like we talked about the different ever- areas with Sichuan being at the highest ever recorded since they enacted in 1961, 38 tributaries or something similar with 19 at a dangerous level in terms of uh, releasing uh, water into some of these floodplains and just making things that much worse. So when we consider the different emergency levels and the, those responses, we, we continue to see about, let's say, as many as 634 rivers throughout the country that have exceeded uh, different warning levels. And, and think about just 634 rivers, many of them being tributaries into the Yangtze. But even if they're not, they could be other tributaries into other areas. And if we just think about manufacturing, about livestock, about uh, crops, you're always going to be near a water source. So losing, seeing this water source move over just means that crops, livestock, and manufacturing will continue to be impacted. And then when we look at it, like by, by last week's estimates, again, it always depends on who, whose mouthpiece you're listening to. 63 million people have been affected once we factor in the other tributaries, the other rivers that have also swelled outside of just the Yangtze, outside of just the um, the three uh, the Three Gorges Dam and the tributaries, about 63 million people or 12.7% higher than average over the last five years. So you're seeing some of this pain and this is coming directly from the Minister of Emergency Manage- Management to give you an idea of just the sheer size of the whole region, not just the river itself, but also as it bleeds out into these other floodplains and into the other tributary regions. Now, this is a good breakdown in terms of just the overall impact of that river economic belt and how much of the area really relies on it in terms of transportation, fresh water, that not only for drinking, but also for livestock and crops. And this is where you can just see just the sheer size of the impact going across the whole region, which is which is why when you think, of, well, how can this area account for such a large component of Chinese GDP, this really kind of nails down just just how important it is, and just what the span and what the, how how far the reaches are in terms of what the what the issues will be as we go through and as you know, China tries to find ways to prop up their economy, which we know is is already weak and weakening, uh, regardless of what the uh, CCP says. So here is just another chart that we've used to really kind of look at just what the uh, GDP numbers are. So when we look at just what the area is pers- uh, is in terms of just the overall Chinese air, uh, accounting for, the Yangtze River you know, covers about 18.8% uh, of land area when you think about just the sheer size and 36% of the population. So 36% of the population, I mean, that, that's also a massive part of the you know, world Earth's population. So think about the sheer size which is why it accounts for that, you know, 40% or so of total GDP. Now, this is interesting in terms of what are the expectations. So when we look at this urban, um, this urban study looking at the population, the GDP, the expectation was for GDP, GDP growth in this area to go uh, to grow about 6% into 2020. We know 6% isn't going to happen into 2020. And then we were going to see a slowdown in growth of about, you know, let's call it one to you know, about one to three percent. So the idea was we were going to see this peak as we saw dams being built. We saw, you know, uh, manufacturing being uh, being built in the area. We we were, the, China has been trying to incentivize not only local Chinese companies to invest and build there, but also foreign entities such as everything from Apple all the way down to uh, to Nike to build facilities there and take advantage of you know the the water and just the amount of uh, of people that live there. So this was the surge that came through really kind of drove GDP growth in the area and it was supposed to peak at about 6% in 2020 and then and then fall back down. The question is how much of that growth is going to be impacted? I'm going to say a lot. And then the question is going to be, how is this going to impact growth as they as we look forward into 2021 and beyond? As you know, as it, was, it was supposed to be about you know, call it again that one to three percent growth, which just doesn't seem likely given the fallout and the sheer damage of these floods. And this is looking at at, at Sichuan Province where about 12% of it is covered in some form of rain, rainstorm, which we have a slide on uh, coming up which is causing about 41 rivers in the total area to exceed warning levels. And again, this is something that we haven't seen yet. And it's just just the the sheer size. So 22 rivers 
exceeded the so-called safe level. But when you think about 41 in a warning, 22 exceeding safe levels, which is why you're starting to see this, this concern as all of this water dumps down and then heads downstream, there's going to be very little that can be done to try to stagger some of this you know, water surge that is going to hit a lot of these dams. And it's really coming to the rainfall in China. And this is, again, coming from just what is expected. And you can see those deep, dark blue areas. And that is the the basin in terms of the, the Yangtze River. Now, the problem when you consider what this is, you, given it always has monsoon season, it always has a rainy season. It's this shift in, in just global warming. How is this moving about and shifting the way people are, are really impacted by these, these water sites. And it's really coming through, this is the worst flooding that we've seen in 60 years. Now, when you consider just when they started keeping track, the problem is this is the worst flood since 2017. And then you have, and you can see that the water levels are just shifting and it's really being caused by this, this warm area in the Pacific that is pushing all of this through, which is going to continue to be a problem. And, and just, you know, again, the number is 3.67 million are displaced. Again, 60 to 65 million totally impacted and a huge amount of issues going forward. And when we think about the different uh, lake, you know, the lake itself, the Peong Lake in, uh, in one of the key provinces has surged past its record level. And the record was set in 1998, which killed about 3,000 people when some specific areas uh, downstream also broke records. And the issue is going to be how do we contain not only the river, but also the lakes, because the lakes have been either built on, flooded over with reservoirs. So there's also less places for the water to go. And this is just a meteorologist in turn being quoted in um, in one of the local papers, just saying that uh, seeing it over the long term, global warming has led to an increase in the frequency, but not only again the frequency, but the intensity of extreme weather, which we're seeing play out throughout this basin. And in the next segment, we're going to really look at what's happening with the Chinese economy and how is that going to impact not only China but other emerging markets, and as it and and how it really relates to the to the rest of the world. Now we turn towards the daily activity indicators, which is something that we always uh, look at in our economy show. So when we talk to you about it, we we want to break things down in, into specific areas. And, and for this uh, specific episode, we're just going to look at emerging markets and look at advanced economies just as an aggregate to really kind of hone in on China itself. So here you can see China has has fallen from those previous highs. Again, this is official data, or we, we try to get uh, realistic data as much as possible, but the, the pressure is going to remain, especially as we have this new flooding surge, and the floods are also going to going are starting to appear in, in uh, export data going into Japan and South Korea, just as you're starting to see some of these economic issues really kind of manifest within China itself. And that's why we count boats so much, because you can follow the boats to try to get an idea of, well, what are the real numbers showing? What is the real data saying? So the trend remains down for China, which is also going to put additional pressure if you consider emerging markets and advanced economies, which have never really recovered. You know, we, we got to this plateau, if you will, call it mid-June, and now we've just kind of gone sideways with different uh, you know, headwinds and tailwinds that have kind of offset themselves, maintaining this, call it 75% of pre-COVID uh, norms, which you can see that really kind of kicked off in the, in February for advanced and emerging markets and obviously China first. But China's never, even, even the official numbers never really got back to that 97, 98% utilization rate that they talk about it. It kind of peaked at 87 and now we're seeing them push closer below 80, especially as new flooding, new types typhoons start to, to, to cause their impact on the region. And here you can see just kind of that breakdown of what are the issues. You know, we, we, had, a, we had a special episode on Turkey, which we talked about the issues that Turkey is facing and why we, we're going to start to see some of those that roll over as well. But the bigger issue is now you have China really taking that step down. And India is the one that there was a lot of bright spots about, well, what could happen with India? India is going to see this resurgence, but India has struggled to get past this 60%. And it's really because you get this offsetting where they have their issues with China in terms of 
uh, Ladakh and the other uh, conflicts that remain, they continue to have the geopolitical pressure, which is also something that's going to weigh on China. You know, you have the the Chinese. Uh, U.S. trade war, which remains the kind of that friction point as we go into an election year, something we're all we we've talked about in the past, and we'll talk about again in more depth. But there's all of these friction points that are going to weigh on China, as especially as you have these pressures. You know, Saudi Arabia, Russia. We could, you know, this is where they need to find a way to make money, and you know, selling crude is one of the only ways, which is why we continue to think. OPEC is going to bleed more and more crude into the market along, not so much above the OPEC plus agreement, but it's again, something that we're going to talk about in our OPEC plus update. But here you can see kind of what those issues are. And we're going to go in a little bit more detail into China in a moment. But we also have to appreciate this isn't just China that's being impacted by rain and and these other uh, uh, setups. You know, South Korea is another one. Again, just looking at trade partners for China, South Korea and Ch- and uh, and Japan had seen benefits from some of this resurgence from China. But as they fall under pressure, we believe that Japanese imports and exports, as well as South Korea, are going to see the same pressure. So not only are they going to have external from the limitations from the Chinese uh, GD, uh, Chinese economy, but also their own rain is is impacting total gasoline demand, and we continue to see these headwinds in terms of just this normalization of activity across these Asian nations. So, oil demand will remain impacted, and we continue to see gasoline and distillate demand impacted on a broad level, which is also putting more product into the market, which is being shipped into uh, Western Europe and Latin America, which is putting pressure on U.S. Uh, exports, which we talked about in our EIA show. But again, like this is how everything is interconnected and how these these floods are really going to have a global impact. Really, you know, obviously the epicenter being within those Asian markets. And that's where we start to turn towards India and we look at what's happening in India itself. And when we look at the Indian oil company refinery run rates, you can see that things have dropped. Uh, you know, right now they've dropped from 93% to 75%. Uh, from in, from early July high. So in July, they were about 93%. Now they're down to 75% and heading down to 70 to 75%. So they believe, so India is saying that they're essentially going to see oil uh, refinery throughput. Instead of being at 75, it's going to average 70 to 75, which again is going to weigh on oil demand as we see more oil push into the market. You know, diesel makes up, makes up about 40% of India's total oil demand. And right now, when we look for August, now that we're about halfway through August, compared to 2019, we have diesel down 22.5%, uh, petrol or gasoline down 5.5%, jet fuel down uh, 66%. And then where LPG is, is fluctuating right now, it's down about 8.5%, but we should see that start to recover into the end of the uh, the month. The bigger focus is diesel because diesel is really reflective of industrial capacity, shipping, movements, and that being down 22.5%, even though it had recovered to uh, only down 16%, you're starting to see those pressures uh, come into the market. Again, something that's also happening in China, what's happening in India, as well as South Korea and Japan, which again, this is why we, we continue to see concerns across total oil demand. And when we look at China activity indicators, you have to kind of pick apart, you know, what is real, what is fake. And here you can see industrial production year over year was up only about 4.8%. Now it was expected to be 5.1%. And just given everything that we just talked about in terms of the economic basin, what's happening with flooding, what's happening with... I mean, do you believe it? I I struggle just because of just where things sit. Now, you could say, well, the industrial production is on the coast, even though we have some typhoons and there's going to be some headwinds. The problem is going to be where does this sit going forward? Because when you look at how GDP is calculated, investments year to date, year over year are down 1.6%, which is that yellow line. And I think more importantly is the retail sales, which is down 1.1% year over year. And the bigger issue is that that local consumer. So we have unemployment, which is elevated even for a communist regime. 
You have people facing flooding. Pay, uh, they face lockdowns in terms of no import, uh, uh, no income or limited income, which is we're, we're continuing to see that carry through when you look at year over year, as you consider the retail sales as well as investments. And just given where the pain is, it's going to be difficult to see a lot of that normalization. And that's, where, that's when we turn to daily activities. So when we, when we look at uh, what's happening in terms of uh, activity levels nationwide, again, that 5.7%, that blue line is the unemployment rate. It remains elevated given kind of where things sit. And then when we look at just total activity, activity is down about 1.6%. And it's something that is continuing to trend lower as we look at some key demographics and, and key uh, kind of inputs for that GDP number on top of not just flooding, but also the exports into some of their, uh, in, into some of their trade partners. And that's why we took, we turned to indebted households. And here you can see that Chinese debt continues to, to rise on the household level. Remember going back down to, back to retail sales, unemployment, you know, the lack of income. Now uh, you, you, we've seen uh, China really the consumer borrowing more, not just on property, but also credit card levels. And that this is why we're starting to see some of these headwinds and people are pulling back on those retail sales, which is going to have a direct drive to just where we see the, just the total number of, uh, of total pain when we're, when we're thinking about you know, the amount of spending. And that's why we, we want to look at, again, the China onshore corporate bond defaults. So when we look at bond defaults, you have to take it into consideration 18, 19. So we had some defaults on not so much on the, uh, it was more on the SOE side, which is just the state-owned enterprises. And you can see the defaults increased in 18 and 19. But again, it was, it was the principal amount was really non-SOE, where you, they, so that, that, that peach line was the SOE, so the state-owned uh, uh, enterprises, and that that orange line is non-SOE defaults. So non-SOE, just private enterprises or or semi uh, semi state-owned, you saw the increase in total uh, bankruptcies or defaults, really. And now through seven seven months of 2020, we've seen about half. You know, we've seen this big increase, and we're only halfway through, or just over halfway through the remainder of the year. So as we continue to see this economic pressure, you know, how are you achieving growth with these kind of numbers, with these kind of pressures, with these kind of issues impacting not only trade, but also manufacturing and just global and just local consumption. So uh, bond defaults are something that we we continue to, uh, to see as a problem, which is going to weigh, oh, again, oil demand, just total demand for anything within China. And as we as we go abroad and we start to think about, OK, well, how are people going to invest in China now that we see these the people moving supply chains out of China instead of into it? You know, what is foreign investment going to look like? And that's where we start to see some of this pressure, which is why the CCP has tried to increase what's called special purpose bonds. And special purpose bonds are used to try to finance infrastructure projects and provincial local projects. And even though they've increased the amount and they fully allocated it, it's just they're not seeing the investment opportunity just because the previous SPBs are being financed with tax revenue, which based on everything we just talked about, tax revenue is down. Fat taxes are down. All of these things are down. So the pressure continues to mount on a country that is over grossly over levered, you know, and, and it sounds shocking coming from an American where America is grossly over levered, but China even more so. So the pain is going to continue and we're seeing that really reverberate through the system. So these are some key issues and updates. Uh, we're going to have more coming out in terms of our economy show. We, we're going to have our, uh, our favorite, uh, the primary vision frac spread count. And then we're going to have our OPEC plus update to round out the week, just to kind of give you uh, some color as to what is OPEC doing, where's oil flowing, and what's happening on the refined product world. So thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. <laughs>